Mr. Bowman. I'm Elizabeth Mitchell, a volunteer with the American Red Cross. This interview is with David Bowman on June 7, 2016, at his home in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Also present with us is Chuck Welch, who's operating the camera. This interview is being conducted for the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress. I'm going to start with some biographical information. All right. What's your full and complete name? David Willis Bowman. And when and where were you born? I was born at a relatively young age in Houston, Texas. Uh, that was June 21st, 1947. Uh, what was your father's name and occupation? My father's name was Lynn or Lindley. Uh, he was an engineer civil engineer and uh, was a veteran of the Coast Guard during World War II. And your mother's maiden name and occupation? Well, her maiden name is Willis. First name is Harriet. Uh, she was technically a housekeeper slant mother, but she was also an accomplished uh, pianist, taught herself how to play the piano, and uh, was very active in, in music. Uh, which uh, rubbed off on some of us. Can you give me the number and gender of your siblings? I have two older sisters, an older brother and a younger brother, five total. Do any of your other family members serve in the military and if so, what did they do? Well, my older brother went into the Air Force after he got out of high school and uh, he served just uh, four, just over four years. Uh, but he was a, a key player in my decision to go into the Air Force uh, because at the time Vietnam was increasing in intensity. Uh, there was more activity in recruiting and or the draft was going on. And he suggested that I had always been interested in airplanes so I should check into the Air Force and go through the ROTC program, which I did. And it worked out real well. And what were you doing before you entered into the service? Well, I was a professional student <laughs> for four years. Uh, went to Casper College in Wyoming and then transferred down to the University of Wyoming in Laramie. And at that time when I made the transfer, I got into the two-year Air Force Reserve Officer Training Program. And uh, that, that's how I got started. And during that time, uh, they had what they called FIP, which was Flight Indoctrination Program. They wanted to see if we really could fly. And so they got us about 30 hours of flight training in a Cessna single-engine airplane, uh, which was pretty exciting. That was a good thing to do. Uh, it, it helped really concrete or basically solidify my ideas about wanting to fly. So, as far as your early days of service, you mentioned that you were in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And uh, you did mention your brother as having an influence of you. Did you draft or enlist? Well, that's the interesting part, is after he suggested that I get into the Air Force, I took the tests, uh, the AFOQT, which was the Air Force Officer Qualifying Test. I took the test and I passed that and I went down and took a physical and I passed that and so I said okay fine I'll do that and I signed on the dotted line saying I would go into the Air Force uh, through the universities program at the ROTC area and uh, one week later I got a notification from my draft board saying they had taken my 2S deferment which if you were a student at that time and going to college full-time student you could get a deferment from the draft. Uh, if they classified you as 1A, that meant you were going to go get a physical and then you had a choice of going into the Army or the Marines. And I was one week away from that. I had already signed the papers with the Air Force and I went down to the draft board and showed them my papers and they said, oh, okay, never mind. So there, but for the grace of God, I could have gone either way, but my brother suggested that, and because of that, I got to go into the Air Force. What happened when you departed for training, and where did you go? Uh, 
pretty much all over. Uh, but the first training I had within the Air Force was through the ROTC program. Uh, we went to March Air Force Base in California and it was a six-week training program to familiarize us with the military uh, way of doing things and uh, to also involve us in various exercises, leadership, training, uh, uh, and exposure to flight operations. And, uh, and that again got my attention. We, we got to go up in an aerial refueling airplane called a tanker, KC-135, and we got to lay in the back of the airplane uh, when it was refueling a B-52 bomber that had come in underneath us and pulled up and we hooked up together and to see a bomber come up that close to you in flight that's impressive. Uh, so I enjoyed that immensely. Uh, I learned that there was something besides Wyoming. <laughs> uh, so it was a bit of a shock for me to come from a town with 5,000 people to go to Los Angeles that was a big, big, big change, but uh, it was a really good step and it was good to have the, the college experience and the ROTC training at the same time. Uh, I thought that was a really good balance. After I graduated from the university, I was commissioned as a second lieutenant and I had about two weeks off and then went immediately to Williams Air Force Base in uh, Phoenix, Arizona and that was my year, what we call the year of 53 weeks. Uh, that was 53 weeks of intensive pilot training and uh, that stuck with me and is still part of my life today. Uh, we have a Facebook account uh, just for our, our particular flight. Uh, we keep in touch with each other. It's something that when you establish a bond like that it stays with you. That, uh, it's, it's something that I value uh, intensely and there's a lot of good things that have come out of that. Did you see, did you receive any training that you would consider specialized training? Well certainly the pilot training was pretty specialized. Uh, during that time we got into various kinds of training situations. Uh, they wanted us to be familiar with and comfortable with the equipment that we were operating. So if you're in an airplane, a high-performance airplane, and you have to get out in a hurry, uh, you don't just walk through the door and step out. You have to be able to learn to work with a parachute, which they did. We practiced falling into a pit. Then we practiced getting into a harness and swinging back and forth with an instructor holding the rope. They called that a swing landing trainer. And when the instructor let go of the rope, you came down and you did a parachute landing fall. We then took it a little one, one step further, routinely, uh, if you're going to do parachute training, you would get into an airplane and you'd go up and jump out of the airplane, but that's expensive. And one thing about the Air Force I saw through the years, they wanted the training to be efficient, realistic, but cheap. So they hooked us up to about an 800 foot rope attached to our chest harness and a parachute fully deployed behind us being held open by two attendants and the instructions they gave us when that truck down there that's connected to your rope when it starts going you start running so that's pretty specialized training and they said once you get airborne in the air keep running which you feel kind of funny about that because it's like riding a bicycle but there's no bicycle but they want you to have that motion going so that if the air deflated the canopy and you came down behind the truck while it was accelerating, you wanted to hit the ground running as versus being drug on your knees behind the truck. Uh, we could get up seven, eight hundred feet above the ground, then they disconnect the rope and you come down and you can do a pretty good landing fall from seven or eight hundred feet. Uh, so we did that part, then they said you need to know what to do if your jet has a problem and while I was in uh, pilot school we had a number of crashes uh, several of them were fatal but one in particular came it was a great attention step because we had ejection seats in the airplanes and so we learned to use ejection seats um, which meant we sat down in a chair similar to this but there were two handles and if you took one handle and raised it it's like cocking a gun or the other one, either one. And inside those handles were levers, that would be the trigger. 
And so when you did that, you assumed the proper position, and that's what they drilled into us. You don't want to eject with your head looking down because you're accelerating from zero to about 45 miles an hour in about a half a second because you have a really big bullet right underneath your butt. And it does. You get back, your head back, your chin down, and your teeth together. Uh -huh. You don't want to do that with your tongue out there because it's you undergo about 14 to 16 G's, so your weight is 14 to 16 times what it would be ordinarily. And that's why you want to be in the proper position. You can't have your elbows out. You, want, you don't want to be looking down. You, you get yourself as straight backed as you can get and then you eject. So we did that. We had an ejection seat attached to a tower. Uh, the tower was about 100 feet tall and it would blow us right up the tower. Uh, and we uh, officially became a member uh, of what they called the Official Military Instantaneous Acceleration Society which the acronym for that is O-M-I-A-S. Oh my, well you get the general picture. Uh, but yeah, we did that later on, sea survival training, we did the same kind of thing but on what looked like a little aircraft carrier. It was a, an old landing craft, they put a flat platform on it, hooked us up to a cruiser and took us out in the ocean and we did the parachute landing in the ocean. And then a helicopter came in and picked us up. So. Uh, a lot of that was to prepare us to be ready to go. Uh, we had on our parachutes what we called a zero delay lanyard. In other words, if we were at 35,000 feet and we had an ejection sequence, we didn't want the parachute to come out right away because it'd be really cold and there's not much oxygen up there and you could float forever. So the idea is, is if you were up there, uh, you wanted to free fall as well as you could so that a barometric timer could open the parachute at a safe altitude. Uh, if you were low altitude, you didn't want that. You wanted to be able to get immediate parachute deployment. So as you ejected, it would pull the D-ring on your parachute so your parachute would come out immediately. Uh, we had a student in pilot school that uh, did not have his zero delay lanyard in the proper position so that he ejected out of the airplane just fine but the parachute had not deployed the D-ring and so his body hit the ground just as the parachute was starting to come out. Uh, it's a great attention step but those kinds of things stick with you. You remember those things. Uh, but flying the, uh, the two jets that I flew were just, uh, it, it was enjoyable. Uh, incredible amounts of work, but acrobatic. Uh, the T-38 that I flew, which is a white uh, supersonic, faster than the speed of sound, uh, we could release the brakes, light the afterburners, and go down the runway, get airborne at about 160 knots, or about 170 miles an hour. By the end of the runway, we'd be doing 230, 240, 250, 260, and we'd hit 350, pull about a 6G pull, and go straight up. Uh, to 18,000 feet and then we'd pull out inverted and then do half an aileron roll and from a standing stop the record was 92 seconds to get up to 18,000 feet. And you're laying on your back and you think you've hitched a ride on a homesick angel. It's just, you know, it's thinking, yes, and I'm getting paid to do this. This is good. During, uh, during the uh, wartime service, where did you serve? Well, we uh, immediately after pilot training uh, I went to sea survival school and that was down in Florida and then from there I went to Little Rock Air Force Base uh, and that's that's where I, I flew these airplanes, the C-130s. Uh, we got into a variety of these aircraft and in fact uh, uh, very good airplanes but very demanding in what you had to do with them. Uh, we did all sorts of training with these airplanes. Uh, we had formation flights that we would do. Uh, we could load up with about 92 paratroopers and if you had a whole group of airplanes you could drop a lot of paratroopers. Uh, we could drop cargo uh, and we had a variety of things. The biggest thing I ever airdropped was a road grader. It weighed about 37,000 pounds. And trust me when 37,000 pounds leaves your airplane all at once, you know it. 
<laughs> the airplane wants to fly. It's, uh, it's an interesting mission. We had long range. The, my first overseas tour, uh, again, was only about a 60-day tour. Uh, but we left Little Rock and flew up to basically Goose Bay, Labrador. We gassed up there. And then from there, we went up over Greenland, uh, to, headed toward uh, Keflavik, Iceland. But whoever named Greenland, Greenland, they didn't look at it in November. Uh, it's the most godforsaken, cold, white and gray. That was about it. And uh, so this was only four months after I graduated from pilot school, headed across the North Atlantic and uh, into Iceland, and then from there into Frankfurt, Germany. Rhine Mine Air Base, and then we rotated there through all the different NATO supported bases uh, throughout Europe, uh, down into Italy, down into uh, Greece, uh, down into Turkey. Uh, we had a mission down there we called the Turkey Trots. And I won't go into why we actually came up with that term, but you didn't want to drink the water there if you get my drift. But that was training worldwide. We were on basically recall so that at any time we could be called up and we always had a big bag of things at home so that if they called up and said go, uh, then we went. And that's what happened to me in 1972. Um, in fact, it's a pretty easy one for my wife and I to remember because at that time uh, I'd gotten married after I got to Little Rock and uh, uh, during our first four or five years of marriage, I was gone about half the time. Uh, so you got used to saying, hi, I'm back, and then I'm gone, and then I'll be back at five, and then you'd call back and say, I'm not really going to be back at five. I'm on my way to Alaska, and uh, I'll be back when I get back. So from a family standpoint, that was significant. The women who stayed home at that time uh, they had their hands full trying to keep a household going, watching the kids, whatever. Um, we didn't have any women in the, in the air crew system at that time. Uh, so that was something that we paid particular attention to, is trying to keep track of where, where your wife is, or where you are. Uh, Mother's Day 1972, they called up and said, go. They said, we can't tell you where you're going. We can tell you it's hot, steamy, subtropical. And our entire squadron loaded up 16 airplanes, and we left Little Rock and flew to McClellan Air Force Base in California and refueled. One of the reasons, and this is kind of interesting, that I knew this was not a drill, because we would practice this, but when I went out to the airplane in Little Rock on our way to Vietnam, uh, a Roman Catholic church, a priest, I'm sorry, was out there in his full robes and he was sprinkling, sprinkling holy water on the nose of my airplane, which they didn't do in the drills. They didn't practice that. Uh, so we kind of thought, I guess this is really going to be what we're going to do. Um, but it worked, so I, I can't argue with that. Uh, we went to California and from California uh, we went to Hickam Air Force Base. Uh, the takeoff out of McClellan was significant because it was the longest takeoff roll I ever had. Uh, traditionally, the C-130 is limited at that time to 155,000 pounds as a gross weight. When we added everything up in California, it was 162,000, and which we pointed out to our operations people saying, we can't go, it's too heavy. And they responded, well, it's wartime and we got special permission and it's okay. I'm like, okay. But we went down the runway and we went down the runway and we were going down the runway and finally got it airborne and we started looking for power lines. We started looking for creek beds. <laughs> it's just like, okay. And we finally got loose of that and yandered off to Hawaii. Uh, spent a night there, and then from there we went to Wake Island, which has got a total land mass of three and a half square miles in the middle of absolutely nowhere. Uh, you wanted to make sure you found that. Uh, from there we went to Guam, and then from Guam on into Taiwan. Uh, we landed at uh, Ching Chung Kang Air Base, or we, we called it CCK uh, Air Base in Taiwan. 
which was a joint use uh, between the nationalist Chinese or the Taiwanese. Nowadays it's not nationalist Chinese, but at that time it was. Uh, and we spent, oh, almost 23 hours on the ground there. And then they launched us on our first mission, which we were still doing a little culture shock and jet lag, but we left and went from Okinawa, or from uh, Taiwan, up to Okinawa and picked up a load of Marines. And then we had a landing gear malfunction and we had to fly back to Taiwan to get it repaired. Once we got back, got it repaired, then we could go to the Philippines, Clark Air Base in the Philippines, uh, gassed up again, and then from there we went to Vietnam. We landed at Benoit, uh, which is just north and north, a little bit east of uh, Tonsonut or Saigon. Uh, we, they were under attack uh, for a period of time, and we could not uh, we could not get refueled there, so we had to wait for a while until things calmed down. Then from there we went across the river and landed at Tonsonut and waited again for a while. We got loaded up and then flew back uh, to Taiwan, which was about a 27-hour crew day. In our airplane we had two full crews so that you didn't have to stay awake the whole time. You could sleep, but for anybody that's tried to sleep in a C-130, there is a certain amount of vibrating that goes on, uh, and it's complicated, but we got back to Taiwan and the landing was, the weather was down to minimums, which meant the clouds and fog were down to where we had to do a, a no kidding instrument approach. When you're 200 feet above the ground and just barely starting to see the lights, it's kind of like, ooh, hey, and then you, see, you hold the altitude for just a second, then you can see it better and you touch down and roll up to the end and and then we had like 100 feet or so left. <laughs> and we pulled off and then they wanted us to go to a briefing at the base theater. And we said, no, we're going to bed. And they said, okay, we'll reschedule it. But we were in Taiwan there uh, essentially for almost five months. Uh, we would rotate out of Taiwan down to Tonsonut in Saigon, and then we would fly airdrop missions uh, out of Tonsonut. We did, our squadron did 100% of all the airdrops while we were there. Uh, every, all the other airplanes were either being used or being repaired. Now, what I didn't know at the time and recently have discovered, and in fact, uh, uh, I've got a son, 40-year-old son, who was not alive when I was in Vietnam, but he's taken it as a special interest for himself. Uh, he's a special needs guy. He is learning disabled. Uh, he's got a lot of challenges, but he also knows how to use the internet. And he was able to pull up about a seven-page documentary on what was happening in Vietnam right before we got there. Uh, a lot of people have heard about the 1968 Tet Offensive. Well, what we were not paying attention to too much at the time, uh, at least in the U.S., there was something called the Easter Tide Offensive. Uh, the Viet Cong, North Vietnamese troops had come in and decided there were two areas they really wanted to come in and take over so that they could use that as a springboard to make a further invasion. Uh, the two towns they were after was one called An Lok, and the other one was called Con Tum. Uh, up to that point in Vietnam, the amount of airdrop that had been done was pretty minimal. Mostly what C-130s were doing was providing cargo transport and people transport from one base to another. Uh, but in An Lok, the good guys, uh, South Vietnamese uh, Army and some of the American advisors still with them, uh, were encircled in a soccer stadium. So the bad guys all the way around it, and they were in there, and the only way they could be resupplied was by air. Since we had not done much of that, uh, we tried to use the systems the way we had trained, and uh, Colonel Isaway was the wing commander at the time, and he had the challenge of trying to get his troops in there uh, to do that. Now, the routine airdrop altitudes were 600 to 1,000 feet, which if you've got a handgun, if you've got a slingshot, if you've got any kind of ability to shoot, 
you can hit a C-130. It's a big airplane. Uh, during that month of April of 1972, uh, there were four C-130s that were shot down, destroyed, everybody killed. Uh, there was a whole bunch of them that were shot up and barely made it back. Uh, some awards were given, uh, Distinguished Service Cross or Flying Cross. Uh, a lot of really, really serious flying going on there. Uh, the Vietnamese Air Force lost three C-123s, uh, similar to the C-130, but a two-engine airplane. Uh, but they were getting shot down. We tried different kinds of ways of doing things. And that's one of the reasons that we brought our airplanes in. Uh, the one way you could distinguish our airplanes is that, that we had a bump up here on the top, uh, which was called a, a radome, uh, and it was part of what we call the Adverse Weather Aerial Delivery System, which allowed us to come in and do airdrops at 11, 12, 13,000 feet. That was significant because as we developed our, our intelligence on what was going on there, not only did they have small arms rifles, they started getting higher caliber rifles that could reach up significantly, and then they also introduced the concept of what we call the Strela, or the SA-7, which was a shoulder-mounted heat-seeking missile that anybody could carry down there. One guy could have one of those. And if you had one of those, they were deadly up to five, six, seven, eight thousand feet. Uh, and with that idea in mind, we didn't really want to deal with that. Uh, we did have one C-130 that came back that had one of those that had hit a landing gear door and stuck in the gear door didn't explode. <laughs> so when you come back it's kind of like you want to be careful. Uh, that kind of flying was impressive. If we took off ordinarily at an airfield we would take off with a low angle climb out. It's the most efficient way but there was intelligence saying that the bad guys were within 20, 30, 40 miles from our base there in Saigon. Uh, so that when we took off, we'd, we spiraled up over the base to get up to a safe altitude. Then we would go to where we were going to do our airdrops. Or if we were going into one of the other bases, uh, Cameron Bay, uh, Da Nang, any of those bases, we would fly in at altitude. Then we would descend right over the field. And we always opened up the parachute doors so that the loadmasters, the crew members in the back of the plane, could see if there was a shoulder-mounted missile that was launched, it would come up in a, a seeking mode, so you'd see a white corkscrew coming up out of the jungle. Um, and then we would wait until it was close enough, which was always kind of hard to estimate, uh, and then we would fire every flare we had. We had hand-mounted hand flare guns. Uh, we also had one on the top of the C-130. They've modified that extensively now, a much better system. Uh, but we would fire those and then we'd pull the power off on the engines and then do a steep turn to mask our infrared signature. And that worked pretty good, especially if there was only one that was fired. So that, those are some of the things that we were looking at and working with. Um, when we landed at uh, Ching Chung Kang Air Base in Taiwan, there was close to 40 C-130s sitting there but couldn't be flown because they'd all been shot up. And that was why they got us, as well as a squadron out of Langley Air Force Base. So they had two brand new squadrons, and we started doing the AWADS drops. And we also did one called GRADS, which was a ground radar assisted drop. So that they could use the radar to focus us into a point at a higher altitude where we could make the drop. We also had new parachutes. The older parachutes weren't as effective, but we had barometric timers uh, in the parachutes and that was one of my jobs uh, when I was there when we get ready to go uh, we would get the altimeter setting the barometric setting and then I would crawl back over the loads of ammunition or cargo food a lot of peaches we set out uh, but I'd go to each parachute package on top and I would go and there was kind of like a skate key and I would set in the barometric setting so that when we dropped the load it would come down almost ballistic. I mean, it had come down, it had stabilizing chutes, but it would get down about uh, two, three thousand feet above the ground. Then the main chutes had come out. 
and we had a very high percentage of success with those airdrops. Uh, the ones that they did back in April, uh, frequently 80 or 90 percent of them went to the bad guys just because it just wasn't working and that's why they called us out and they really did need us out there. Because of that we were able to hold off the, uh, the attack by the, uh, the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong uh, at both locations and that certainly slowed their degree of success. Uh, at that time we were going through what we called the Vietnamization where we were trying to pull ourselves, extricate ourselves out of the situation and allow the South Vietnamese government to take over what they were doing. And that was what we were trying to work with, but it was a difficult process. There were so many different aspects of, the, of what was happening at that time. Uh, it was difficult for the Vietnamese to try and work with that. Uh, it was a cultural leap for them and it was very difficult for them to do. Just to backtrack real quick, when you when you saw all of the planes that were not flyable, that were damaged and, and so forth, and I'm sure you witnessed casualties and other destruction, what, what kind of feelings were going through your head about the dangers involved? We weren't really concentrating on the dangers per se. What we were concentrating on what we needed to do to avoid those problems. Um, the one value that I came away with and uh, a lot of people that were there came away with a significant understanding of the concept of trust uh, and teamwork. Uh, in the airplane we used to say, you know, if I'm, uh, if I'm the pilot and I'm talking to the guys in the back of the plane, um, any one of us could do something that would cause the problem. Uh, the plane could crash. And I said the only difference was is that if I'm the pilot in the front end of the airplane, I'll get to the scene of the accident about a half a second before everybody else. So there was that concept of working together. Uh, whether you were in an airplane or whether you were on the ground, uh, you really learn the value of working with each other, taking care of each other. Uh, and that's something that we did significantly. Uh, one thing that you see a lot of in uh, Traditionally, there's a lot of attention given to the fighter aircraft, the, the bombers, uh, and certainly uh, that is due to them. Uh, they had significant challenges to deal with. Uh, but something that I think was somewhat unsung was the role that the other people played in the utility aircraft. Uh, uh, the FATs or the forward air controllers. Uh, I had friends that flew those, uh, one of them was killed there. Uh, the people flying the C-130s, uh, we didn't have an offensive weapon in the bunch. But, you know, they say, well, what could you do? Well, I could pull the plower off and crash on somebody, but that was, you know, so we were professional targets. Uh, my first landing that kind of got me spooked a little bit at Da Nang is a truck pulled up in front of us, uh, base operations, and uh, on the side of the truck it said, Rocket City Base Ops, Base Operations. And I thought, what, what's that there for? And, and they were there when we pulled in to stop, fuel trucks were up there. Boy, they were, we got service like nobody's business. We got a lot of service. And, and I said, this is really nice. You know, this is good. Uh, and they said, well, whenever you Mike Mike's come in, we want to get you out of here as fast as we can. I, and I looked in my C-130 manual and it didn't say anything about Mike Mike. And that was mortar magnet. Uh, whenever they'd see one of these come in, they'd say, whoa, you know, and drop some rounds in and the rockets would come in and it would get attention. Uh, we had one of our navigators that was kind of cute. Uh, we had a rocket attack going on and so when you hear an explosion, you, uh, you know, you want to take cover. And so he laid down flat on the pavement, which is okay, uh, but he was right under the wing of the C-130, which maybe he's not the best place to be. And we suggested that, and so then we went on off to the, uh, the revetments where it was a little safer. Um, but uh, really that concept of working together to make things happen is significant. And I've, I've talked to veterans from World War II, I had one friend from World War I, he was a German pilot, <laughs> 
He was my boss in Wyoming at the highway department when I worked up there. His name was Bill, but when he came from Germany, he was called Wilhelm. But in the 1920s, having a name like Wilhelm and having a heavy German accent, he became Bill, and that was a better thing. But when I went to pilot school, he was, he was the head of the engineering department for the highway department, but I came back and told him about going supersonic, and he was just like an eight-year-old kid. He just really wanted to know because his planes didn't go supersonic. They were going fast if they got to 120. Uh, so there's there's so many different aspects of that, just really kind of interesting. But uh, um, they at that time had in World War One, World War Two, there was in fact there was a movie called The Band of Brothers. Uh, I got to talk to one of those guys and he showed me pictures that he had taken with his camera of the death camps uh, in Germany when they discovered those. Uh, you hear sometimes about people saying oh, that oh, those things didn't happen, uh, but they did. Uh, I had dinner in Portland, Oregon, where I lived before I came here, with three women. All three of those women had tattoos, their tattooed numbers on their forearms. Uh, two of them had PhDs. Uh, one of them didn't, but certainly could have. Incredibly bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, educated, you would never have guessed their background. Uh, same thing in Cambodia. After Vietnam was over, technically the killing fields occurred. And this is something that I get a little bit on a high horse or get on my soapbox, because I've talked to recent college and high school students who have, number one, no idea of what happened in World War II. Uh, one, I, I've got a neighbor who uh, is a Marine, and he landed at Guadalcanal, 1942. Uh, and I told this young woman, she's a junior at the university, he was at Guadalcanal, and I saw no flicker of recognition. I said, how's your knowledge of World War II? She said, well, okay. I said, do you know who we, the United States, were fighting against in the Pacific Theater of Operations? Mm, nope. Nothing. That concerns me. Uh, then I asked her if she knew about the killing fields in Cambodia. Uh, after Vietnam was over, our squadron was deployed to Thailand. Uh, we were flying a C-130 and we had the Playboy logo the bunny logo on the tail of the airplane. And our flights were called bunny flights. Bunny one, bunny two. Uh, don't know who came up with that, but it was distinctive. Uh, we would take off out of Thailand and we would go to the border with Cambodia and then we would, we would officially disappear for several hours. Where we would then work throughout Cambodia trying to support the local folks against the Khmer Rouge. Pol Pot uh, was the head of that group and he systematically murdered a million of his country people. People out there nowadays don't know that. And if they don't know that, they assume everybody else is a cool person and they wouldn't do a thing like that. But they do. So that's something that I just had to touch on just briefly there. Uh, I had a situation that developed recently I talked to a young woman who is a professional. She is a lawyer here in Fayetteville. Uh, she was the first uh, Vietnamese born lawyer to be licensed with the bar to practice law in the state of Arkansas. And uh, she had made a presentation at a networking group that I was in. Afterwards, I went up and talked to her because we had a mutual area of interest. Uh, and that's something that I found that was significantly lacking, and that was obviously public support. Uh, Walter Cronkite, uh, the news media, made it look like we weren't doing much at all. Uh, we were not being given a full deck to work with. In other words, we had to do whatever they said to do. Our hands were tied frequently on doing what needed to be done militarily to finish what was going on and could have been done quite a bit sooner. Uh, when we got home, uh, you hear things about people calling us baby killers. Uh, I didn't see any of that. I did see that we did incredibly good things with a lot of people there. We helped them out a bunch. 
obviously there would have been losses in the war. Uh, there were things that happened that shouldn't have happened. Uh, but at the same time, when we came back to the United States, we were not treated with any degree of respect. Uh, I had a woman throw a uh, soft drink or milkshake, I'm not sure what, throw it at my government vehicle. I was in uniform and uh, she wanted to express her feelings about that. Uh, now back to what we frequently see is we, we see people nowadays, uh, in fact President Clinton said that to me directly uh, and he said thank you for your service and quite a few people do that. And after this particular meeting at our networking group and I started talking to our lawyer uh, told her that I flew C-130s there in Vietnam and she started to say thank you for your service but she grabbed my hand and then pulled me into what I would describe as a rib cracking hug and her voice her mouth was right next to my ear and she was saying thank you thank you thank you she had gotten out of Vietnam just before it fell on a U.S. military aircraft. Um, and I'm generally pretty mean and nasty and, um, you know, but I was, there were, a, a, I missed it up a bit, uh, but I mean, it was like, there was like 60 people around, but it was just him and, or her and me. And uh, that was without a doubt the most significant thank you I ever got. Um, the trouble with that is is that there's still a whole lot of veterans out there that didn't get that. And that's one of the reasons that we have a lot of programs and systems in effect out there now for veterans that are coming back uh, from what they call the sandbox, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, those areas. And you will frequently find that a lot of the people that are making that happen just happen to be veterans. And a lot of us Vietnam veterans. You mentioned friendships that you developed. Um, mm -hmm. Have you kept in touch with people over the years? Do you oh, know yeah, other yeah. veterans in Vietnam and also newer? Well, the uh, the biggest thing was our Air Force pilot school, and uh, and that was a uh, uh, a group of us. All of us served in Vietnam, and we just recently, uh, what three years ago, we had a reunion, and. Uh, and it was a, a huge event for us. We had 26 of us there. Uh, we, we lost one of our folks, a forward air controller in Vietnam. Uh, we had another one killed in a, a training accident. Uh, we had another one died. Um, he was what they call a ranch hand pilot. Uh, he flew the airplane that was dispensing Agent Orange. Uh, and he died of a blood cancer. Uh, they had told him that there would not be a problem, and there was. Um, so we lost friends that way, but rather than focus on that part, uh, we had one of our pilots that uh, went on to get advanced degrees, uh, master's, PhD, at a little school, MIT, Massachusetts Institute of something, technology. Uh, he put together some experiments and submitted them to NASA, and he went up in the space shuttle twice, not as a pilot, although he could have. Uh, he went up as a payload specialist, uh, sending out tremendously positive kinds of things. Uh, he got out of the military, and then uh, after NASA, he became an airline pilot. And he would frequently carry pictures from space. Uh, incredibly positive and wanting to encourage. Uh, there was a movie that came out, uh, it was called... Uh, Oh, let me see. It had Tom Cruise in it. Um, not Top Gun, uh, but he played a, uh, an American soldier in Japan. And uh, he was dealing with what they call the Last Samurai. And in the latter scene of that, uh, the Emperor asks him, uh, how, did, how did he die? And Tom Cruise's line was, well, I won't tell you how he died, but I'll tell you how he lived. Um, the group of students that I went through pilot training with, tremendous potential, incredible bunches of college degrees. Uh, we had one who became a two-star general. Uh, we just lost him recently. He went to sleep and never woke up, but really, really incredibly capable people. Airline pilots, uh, high-ranking officers, 
uh, entrepreneurs, people back into businesses, all sorts of things, and we keep in touch. We use Facebook, we use emails, uh, we call. My, my best friend from pilot school was a Marine. Uh, during the Vietnam years, uh, Navy training was full. They couldn't train them all at Pensacola, so they sent a group of Marines out to various Air Force bases. And we got a couple of them, and we always had fun playing, you know, little jokes here and there. But I keep in track of him. Uh, I call him, he's on my speed dial, and we talk all the time. Uh, that part of it is significant. And since that time, I've gotten more involved with, with veterans' activities. Uh, going down, for instance, uh, with our uh, Memorial Day celebration, Veterans Day, uh, wreaths down there at the, uh, the National Cemetery, wreaths around the, the cemetery at Christmas time. Uh, getting a chance to talk to people, we had a guy down there that is now not doing too well, but he was with Patton's troops in World War II. Uh, my neighbor, 93 years old, plays a piano like nobody's business, but he was the one at Guadalcanal. Hippie hopped through the, uh, the Pacific, uh, although the universities didn't, didn't know about the island hopping campaign, <laughs> or the Battle of Okinawa. Uh, I was on Okinawa, he was on Okinawa. My uncle was a World War II pilot and he crash landed at Okinawa. Uh, I did too later on uh, in my C-130, but that was another story. Uh, I got into a taxi cab when I was stationed in Okinawa. And I was in my uniform, similar to what I have right now, and the taxi driver said, uh, are you a pilot? I said, yeah. And he was a little older, some gray hair. And he said, ah, uh, gunner, <laughs> shook down uh, B-29s. And I'm thinking, no, oh, I got into the wrong taxi. And heavy traffic in Okinawa is a scary thing. Vietnam was easy. Traffic in Okinawa, heavy, he's tearing his shirt open, leaning back to show me the scars on his chest because the Americans shot up his truck and the glass and everything and they captured him and they made him a POW. And then he said, they take me to Hawaii. Very nice. Love Hawaii. Now, <laughs> in the Battle of Okinawa, the commander of the Japanese forces against the American invasion told everybody, the civilians and the military, that when we invaded, we would kill all the men, we would rape the women, and we would eat the children. And he told them that to the extent they believed it. There's a place on the southeast corner of the island called the Suicide Cliffs, where a bunch of people committed suicide, jumped off. There was film footage of mothers holding babies jumping off the cliff. This little guy, when he got captured, <laughs> he figured, that's it, they're going to shoot me. And some of that may have happened, but in his case, he got to go to Hawaii. He was like, all, he was really impressed. The concept is there's so many different aspects to this. Um, it's important, and I, when I do a public presentation, I deputize every person there. Uh, specifically civic clubs, church groups, whatever. Uh, but those of us who lived through some of this need to get out and make sure people understand some of these things really did happen. And they can happen again if you're not paying attention. When you, um, when, did you stay in the military until the Vietnam War was over or did you end your military career? No, no, I, uh, I stayed in for 20 years. Oh, okay. um, after Vietnam was over, uh, I was flying C-130s there at Little Rock, and uh, they, gave it, they gave a chance for us to volunteer to fly C-130s in Okinawa, which I did. Okay. I said, yeah, I'll go out there, and so we served in Kadena in Okinawa, and uh, I was in an airplane there that crashed. Uh, in fact, I've got a, uh, a picture that I can show you here. Uh, this was our airplane after it crash landed. We had a throttle cable failure that, that allowed our number four engine, the one on the far right wing, uh, allowed it to go to full power just as we were touching down, the other three at idle. Uh, they were able to track back and find out how it happened 
uh, and the crash analysis, and it was a case of a civilian lowest bidder repair company that didn't quite finish up the work on it, and that's what happened with our airplane. Uh, we were the first crew to crash and destroy the airplane, and we all survived. Uh, this is another view of the airplane. Uh, it was a hot fire. It melted the fuselage of the airplane. Uh, and we were all back on flying status within about two weeks. Uh, again, in this particular case, we'd been trained. We knew how to get out of the airplane. Every time we flew, we talked it over so that we knew how we could get out of the airplane the best way. And it worked. Uh, so I, I think that's an important part to what we did as far as the training was concerned. Uh, I wanted to show you one other set of pictures here. Uh, and these are pictures that, this is a picture of me in the cockpit of a C-130 uh, that was during a combat mission. And down here is a picture of the C-130 that's offloading, they call it a CDS drop or container delivery system, uh, where we drop out 16 2,000 pound bundles uh, all at once. And uh, that's what we were resupplying when I talked about Anlock and Contum, this is how we resupplied them and again with a very high percentage of recovery that allowed us to turn the tide in that particular battle. Uh, there is a, a whole lot that can be done with today's military uh, and today's veterans and that's something that I would really want to stress that it's important for those of us who have been through this to sit down and talk like this and I really appreciate what you're doing uh, to help make that happen. So how would you say the wartime experience or your experience in the military, how has it affected your life? Made me appreciate a whole lot more about what we have here in the United States. Uh, a friend of mine who is a general, uh, he, uh, he frequently talks to people and says, you know, some people joke about uh, winning the lottery uh, and that being part of the budget, which <laughs> I think that's a great thing. I'm still waiting to win. Uh, but as he pointed out, he said, I was born an American, so I will, I've already won the lottery. Uh, when you live in a foreign country and you see what they have to put up with, it gives you a, a huge sense of pride in what's going on here and a huge motivation to try and keep that going to make certain that what we're doing is providing our children and our grandchildren a reasonable world to live in. So that, that's the biggest part of that uh, and I've had a chance to get to talk with an incredible bunch of people, uh, veterans. Uh, I've gotten a chance to talk to uh, space shuttle commanders and of course payload specialists. I've got a chance to talk to one of the cosmonauts, uh, Yuri Romanenko. Uh, he had the time and space record for a while, but when I met him at a formal dinner, uh, he was in his Soviet uniform and I was in my Air Force uniform, and I mentioned my friend who's named Byron, who had gone up in the space shuttle twice. And he said, oh, I was with Byron last week. And all of a sudden, yeah, if you're up at 55,000 feet or higher, uh, the Earth does not have boundaries per se. I mean, if it's a nice clear day, you can see the ocean and the land, but you don't see that. Uh, the astronaut corps, the cosmonauts, they frequently have a, a much more worldly view as to what's going on. And that's something that, again, we need to pay attention to.